Hey, what's up, vinyl community? It's Robert Fithin, and today I want to talk all about cassette tapes. Cassette tapes try to make a, a bit of a comeback for a little bit. I don't know if they did or not, but there's a lot of interest that got developed again. And I think a lot of people, like myself, got a little bit nostalgia of us that grew up in the uh, 80s, uh, buying a lot of these things and playing them all the time on different players. Now, the first part of the video, I'll talk about cassettes, and then uh, at the end there, I'll throw in some things about certain cassette players. But this video is all about cassettes. Now, as you can see, the cassettes I have are a lot of pop and, and kind of some country and stuff like that. These are the things that I never really, you know, I, I, I gave up all the Led Zeppelin and the Pink Floyd and all that stuff. I traded that all in for CDs back in the day. So these are the ones that I'm just kind of left with. Let's just go over some things here really quickly. Pick up the bangles here. You'll notice that the bangles has the, uh, the red here, just like a lot of these do like the Michael Jackson, uh, the Mick Jagger, Tina Marie. Those are all on CBS. And uh, CBS had that big uh, red uh, thing there with the number on there. And uh, tapes were really kind of known for their spines like that, you know, more so than uh, CDs and definitely LPs. Uh, CDs, each, each label had their own kind of spine thing going on. And you can see here that Warner Brothers always had this. It was always black with the Warner uh, logo there. And then on the back, usually... Uh, they had the track listing, uh, side one down one side, side two down another side with that UPC in the middle there. There's Prince and the Revolution. Of course, Prince is different. He gets his he gets his stylized writing on the uh, spine because uh, he's special. But you can see here in the early uh, pre-1984 Warner Brothers, before the UPC was added, they would just have the side one listed and uh, side two like that. And uh, as you can see here, Blank tape at the end of side one is necessary to duplicate the sequence of the LP. You'd have that sometimes on uh, cassette tapes, too. Sometimes they'd change the order of the songs around, and, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't match the LP. But I, I, consumers, I think, got really tired of that, so um, they decided to go ahead and just have blank tape at the end of one side. Uh, so, yeah, more Warner Brothers here. The same look. Same look for the Best of Arlo Guthrie. Uh, Warner logo there, the, the basic font there, and then the... Uh, you know, the UPC with side one and side two. Uh, again, that started in 84 with those UPCs. Uh, let's see. Aristas were usually orange. They have the orange back here. They had the real bright red here. And the titles were always written like that. That was Arista's uh, thing. We got some Bananarama <laughs> to show us Polygram. And they always had the beige back, beige kind of tan thing there going on. And, uh, you know, they were always, uh, Polygram was always like, their, their, their tapes were always cracked up, it seems like. They were beat up. Here's another Polygram. This is interesting. Def Leppard's High and Dry, the cassette, had that special 1984 mix of Bringing On The Heartbreak that added those uh, those awful keyboards. That, 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 bring in on the, yeah. Uh, that was forgotten about. That didn't make the CD cut. So if you want the uh, 1984 remix that was somebody's great idea of bringing on the heartache, you got to get the um, cassette of High and Dry. It, there's another one. Let's uh, check out right under it. Digital Underground Sex Packets. There's like four songs on here that aren't on the, um, aren't on the album. Di Hip Hop Doll is one, I know. Uh, I'm not sure about the others, but yeah, this, this has got way too many songs to fit on an LP, and they didn't even put them on the CD exclusive two cassettes from uh digital underground duran duran rio here's the way the capital cassettes looked if you were um funny about the like i said about the spines here because capital would always have the name and whatever and this big upc code that was bob seeger that's iron maiden you know iron maiden tapes would look the same as a juice newton tape from the side you know later uh beatles comps had that as well now of course i'm just talking about USA tapes here. I'm not sure what was going on in other parts of it. Here's a special one that if you um, gave enough UPC labels from ET Serial, you got the MCA tape, and it was MCA because MCA usually had the blue thing here, and then the blue writing uh, in a uh, kind of a slanted font. That was always MCA. Um, you know, uh, Leonard Skinner, Tom Petty, BB King, Barbara Mandrell, whatever. MCA had that, but this is something you could only get. It's Michael Jackson like narrating the ET story, and of course you had to uh, you had to send in Q or the box tops or whatever for that. Here's an example of a very old cassette. This is probably the oldest one I have. Country singer named uh, Narvel Feltz, and you can see that when tapes were out in the um, you know the 70s, especially they, they a lot of them had like labels on them. They weren't printed directly on the tape, and they didn't sound very good at all. Look at that. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb, not always true, but it's a good rule of thumb that the more like reddish 
brown your tape is, the less quality. You want like a darker color if you want quality. But I remember I used to have Led Zeppelin 4 on like a really old tape from like 74, 75 or something. And this the label was actually, I could peel it off and under it was uh, was Roberta Flack. <laughs> uh, let's see. Interesting thing about the Monkees when they re-released that, for Monkees fans, when they re-released that on cassette for Rhino, you can tell that Papa Jeans Blues is spelled with a J. So they did the misprint LP for the uh, initial cassette release. You know, again, EMI, you know, so the Red Hot Chili Peppers look the same as Corey Hart. <laughs> the Cure have somewhat of an interesting tape here with the compilation. Uh, this one is called Standing on a Beach, the singles. The LP and CD are called Staring at the Sea. Um, this is actual A and B sides. So side one is the entire album, and then uh, side two is all these B-sides, and that didn't get released uh, until a lot later when they did uh, Connect the Dots. So this is this was the only way that you could get those B-sides compiled, was to get this cassette. But what about when these cassettes were brand new? What about purchasing new cassettes? Well, unless you've got them through the aforementioned mail order companies and paid all the extra shipping and handling and then waited about, oh, three weeks or four weeks for them to finally arrive in the mail, you went to the store and bought cassettes. And the earliest way I can remember seeing them in a store was they were kind of like 8-tracks. They were always behind plexiglass. If you wanted to know what was on the tape, you basically had to go find the record and look at the track listing there. And then if you wanted to buy the cassette, you had to go get a store employee or there'd be one walking around the record department or whatever. And they would have to actually unlock it, go through all that, give you your tape or your tapes or whatever. Um, the 8-tracks at least were bigger so that the hole, they had a hole in where you could put your hand through and at least, you know, look or whatever, but not the cassettes. Later on, I got tired of all that going to get the employee for a damn tape. So then they came up with these security devices, which they encased everything in this plastic. And some of them, the store took off themselves as some sort of punch thing. And sometimes you took them home and had to cut, cut them away from the cassette. You cut your finger or cut through the cassette or whatever. These things were not easy. Some of them were uh, not easy to uh, get the cassette out of there. But that's how you purchased uh, new cassettes. This is from uh, Concrete Music Magazine. This is a promotional tape they sent out. Uh, hard music featuring the best of today, you know. And uh, you had on here, uh, you know, Marilyn Manson when they were first out. Uh, Bruce Dickinson when he went solo. Uh, Robin's band is on here. Reverend Horton Heat, Sepultura. So it's all of the really hard stuff. Uh, and these are my college days here. You can see right there, August of 94, Concrete Music Block from uh, Concrete Magazine. I got rid of so many of my tapes and traded them in for CDs, but I did keep some of the Prince ones just because of the nostalgic factor for me. I was really into him when I was into, uh, same time I was into cassettes. So I remember I got introduced, I don't have it anymore, but I got introduced to uh, Dirty Mind and Controversy on a uh, two-for-one Warner Brothers tape where they actually had an entire Dirty Mind album on one side, the entire Controversy album on the other side. And uh, yeah, it, that's how I was introduced to those albums. They used to have the two-for-ones. These old uh, Sex Pistols releases, these guys had like one album, but they certainly made the most. Here's a live thing that was out and some kind of weird, almost bootleg kind of thing. We've come for your children. <laughs> Again, live stuff and just kind of bootleg, uh, you know, never mind the bullocks. I used to have that, but I got CD'd as well. This Nine Inch Nails Closer has the uh, the video version, the live version of March on the Pigs on the B-side. I don't know if it ever got put on CD, but I never could find that on CD. So I ended up uh, keeping this Nine Inch Nails CD or cassette single. Here's a later day Warner Brothers. They switched from the black and uh, basic font to this red with or this white with really thin red font on the uh, on the spine there. 86 is when they did that. So Van Halen, 5150, ZZ Top Afterburner, they all look like that as well. Now here's an example of the difference between getting a tape in the store, brand new sealed as a matter of fact, flash dance, uh, and getting it from a, uh, or a mail order company like Columbia House, right there. That's the difference. I mean, store-bought, Columbia House, Columbia House, about 80% of what they put out, the spine looked like that with the two uh, little pink lines, like the EPT test. And uh, yeah, it wasn't very exciting. There was usually 
you know, nothing in the uh, card. But that was, you know, 14 for a penny. What do you want? The tapes inside always look different. But if you got a CBS tape from Columbia House, you didn't have to worry because they were always identical. More CBS here, like Weird Al Yankovic. This was always the way that Electra's looked with their emblem on the side, like the cars and Howard Jones. Here's X Ain't Love Grand. The back would have the UPC like Warner Brothers, but it would just be more of copyright information, production information. They would always have the track list on the front. And CBS's would have track lists on the front too, for the most part. Not, that's not a good example. How about uh, this one? Uh, this is a uh, an American release of Kissing to be Clever with a different track listing than, you know, when they went to CD, they went to the UK uh, version. But you can see here, a lot of them, you know, they would put the songs and then we would say C label for sequence. It's like, well, just put the songs in the order they're on. Why, why would you put them in another order besides the sequence they're in? This is interesting about Blondie's uh, debut cassette. Uh, as far as I know, this album's called Blondie, right? It's called Blondie on the uh, LP. It's called Blondie on the CD. For some, It's called Blondie here, and it's called Blondie here. But for some reason on the spine, it's called Blondie Waiting. I don't know why. I never, I, I got an answer for that. But it looks like they're kind of waiting in a line. I don't know if that's somebody screwed up or what. Here's some examples here of, um, you know, cassette singles. You know, you just, uh, it was a sleeve. They usually came in and you just... You know, one side, usually both songs on each side or one song uh, per side, you know. And occasionally you'd get tracks that weren't on the album, like uh, Wasted Rock Ranger from <laughs> Great White. Um, you know, the Dead Milkmen even had a cassette single. Uh, yeah, so back in the day when I was young, I, I used to wish I was a kid, but I'm not a kid anymore. I wish I was a kid. Well, whatever the hell that song is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, basically, uh, you know, you had another Polydor here. We went all the way to Hank Williams Sr. Uh, Tina Turner, another one. I love this cover, but for whatever reason, it was only on the cassette and LP when they went to CD. They went to the UK track listing with a really tacky-looking uh, UK cover. This, this cover was so popular that there was a fictitious movie made about the photographer. Here's an example of a current tape. This was sent out to radio stations on the mixtape tour when New Kids on the Block got back together again. Nice, you know, homegrown-looking cassette there. And if you play it, it's the uh, it's the advertisement for their fan telephone line or or whatever they had. Rocky Horror Picture Show on uh, of the audience participation on cassette. Yeah, I never, I never got around to getting that on, on CD. The, the the soundtrack and the movie and all that was, I was good. Here's what would happen if you went to a, um, you know, like a record fair or something like that, and they had the bootlegs. They would sell things like this, just Nirvana Live in New York City, you know, with handwriting. You know, sometimes they you could they could play it for you, let you know about the sound quality. There's Nirvana Live in Rome, just a, a bootleg that they would sell, just like that, right off the blank tape. A um, whole lot of Richard Pryor. <laughs> I think we've. Uh, Gone into the uh, the comedy section here. But yeah, uh, cassette singles and, uh, you know, the different spines for the different uh, labels. Here's Atlantic. All the Atlantics look like that with the blue and then the uh, the light blue or the uh, small blue under it. Snoop Dogg. A lot of the uh, 90s cassettes used to have this Digilog label on the uh, back of it, uh, making you think it sounded better because it was originally uh, digital or whatever. Uh, radio promo, you know, white label promo would look like that on a cassette. And just side one and side two, and then your generic whatever. And early days, cassettes were, uh, you know, more like this. They were not see-through. They were usually that color. You know, it was around 85, 86 that we started seeing the uh, see-through uh, cassette with the see-through back. Still still cutting off the, the artwork there, though. Not like this Madonna CD. Here's my uh, first trip to uh, Canada. I got a Canadian CD here, or a Canadian cassette. I keep saying CD. Canadian cassette here. This is what a Canadian Warner Brothers looks like. They have a super cassette here. They want you to know this is super. It's from Canada. And uh, instead of cutting off here, their artwork went all the way to the back of the cassette. Now, later ones in the United States would do that, but not, not early ones like this Madonna. And I love this spine here. That's pretty cool. They have this like ridge thing with the WEA logo on it. I thought that looked pretty sharp. Um, but yeah, nothing as far as you open it up and it's all blank. So it's like, um, 
This Jackson's one here, I think, is the one with the uh, record bar. Yeah, the record bar thing, guarantee. Where they actually put the date. Oh, wow, July, is that? Yeah, July 4th. Wow, it's almost the anniversary, 1984. Apparently, I bought this for $6.99. And then went, well, I don't need the CD of that, Jackson's uh, Victory. Michael Jackson Thriller was pretty iconic tape. Everybody had that tape where the uh, the picture was at the top of the track listing. Here's another Atlantic, you know, version of that Atlantic with that blue. Here's some 80s rockers. Let's see who the 80s rockers are. They are people like, uh, well, Culture Club, of course, Dead or Alive, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. Uh, but, you know, Face to Face, Psychedelic Furs, and the cover looks like that. Okay, that's some rocking. This fucking Falco. I uh, I mentioned before that I took German just because of Falco and Nana and those two Beatles German songs. I wanted to learn German. It was in like the eighth grade. And I was so excited. I love this Rock Me Amadeus song. I went out and saved up and bought the tape. And the tape is some some stupid version that's not even the German rap version. That You know, the video is like in German, right? That's what I wanted. And this is some stupid thing with some guy going 1886 Amadeus Mozart did this 1895 Amadeus Am Am Mozart took a piss or you know whatever the hell it is and it's stupid and I just wanted the rap one they could have put both on there but they decided not to here's some uh, later like 1984 Sebado <laughs> on Sub Pop uh, with the black they started going back to a cheaper you know kind of tape like this here there's a Jimmy uh, Red Wines yeah Red Red Meat is similar they started going back to like a cheaper thing in the 90s because people stopped buying them pretty much i remember i had a friend that had a candle box on the cassette and i'm like where in the world did you even find that um uh, but yeah that's pretty much it the difference between the ones you'd get in the, the the store and the ones you'd buy you know uh through columbia house um rca usually look like that theirs were black with a real generic you know thing there but not always sometimes they'd they'd, they'd be true to the original um artwork here's an example of this dolly parton of when they would uh, release on a budget and they would, you know, this is a 10 song album and they just go ahead and take two tracks off and just throw them away and call it a budget release. That was really popular. I said I got rid of all my Led Zeppelin, but I do still have this crazy song remains the same cassette. This is wild. Check out this artwork. Okay, you have side one and side three on this cassette. So it's like those old records. They had, one, you know, side one and side three and then side two and four so you could flip them over. But what's the point of that on a cassette? I mean, I don't get that for a cassette, but okay, one and three are here, and they're listed on the front here. Okay, here's the other cassette. Two and four are listed on the back of this, but if you bought it, you had to have access to the UPC, so it would come like this, where you couldn't see any of the tracks. <laughs> and of course, one of those early cassettes with no artwork, no nothing. You know, you probably paid double for this, invested some serious money, and you get nothing. They, they did remedy that later on. You know, they did start adding uh, more artwork on the insides of CDs. You can see here, um, like on this Public Enemy, uh, you know, and they did start extending the the artwork past that little tab there. But this one, you know, doesn't have a lot as far as artwork on the actual thing here. Just, you know, some black and white or whatever. But this whole thing folds out and, uh, you know, just makes, you know... This, this wouldn't happen on a cassette before. I think, like I said, I think these artists started like, and consumers started like uh, saying, you know, we're paying just as much for tapes. We're going to need, uh, we're going to need our artwork in there as well. You know, those early ones just, uh, you know, we're not, you know, Tina Marie here. You know, some words. <laughs> and you were lucky if you got that. Hey, here's Paul McCartney. Uh, Pipes of Peace. Now, this should, if I remember correctly, have blood on it from when I lost a tooth. Let's see here. Oh, wow, I don't... Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I can't get rid of that. That's got blood on it. I remember Beatles tapes, too. I don't have any. Um, I never really had many uh, because I, I kind of went right from album from record to, to cd with those guys but i do remember my one beetle tape though and it was revolver uh i wanted to see how they sound remastered but i did not have uh a cd player when the beatles cds first came out i didn't get one until 1988 when the prices 
decree. So I got a Beatles tape because I, I, I they, they re-released all the Beatles with the UK versions. And uh, I didn't have a CD player, but I wanted to get a tape and see how they sounded remastered on a tape. And I got Revolver. I didn't really look at it. A Revolver, cool. I love this album. I wanted to hear the remastered tape. Got it out to the parking lot. Got it in my uh, car. And it starts playing Good Day Sunshine. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe... No, the UK version starts off with Taxman 2, right? And then the next song comes on and it's totally out of order. And then that, that's what they did. They did. They came up with this line in like 87 or so. And it was all the UK versions. It was in the US and all the tracks were in strange orders. Why did they do that? I have no idea. Revolver starts off with Good Day Sunshine. It's just very, very strange. Uh, never got the story on that. Never found out why they did that. But you would think... By 1987 or whatever, America had messed with the Beatles catalog enough at that point, but apparently not. We're going to rearrange, we're going to use the 14 songs on Revolver instead of the, you know, 11 or whatever's on the American one, but we're going to do them all out of order. Very strange Beatle cassette. If you check out this Tina Turner tape, you'll notice that uh, the spine of it says XDR. That's something capital uh, did in the uh, mid-late 80s, expanded dynamic range. Not only did they have this emblem on all their tapes to let you know just how awesome they sounded, but uh, the XDR had an actual set of tones that would start off and finish your tape, even if it was a cassette single. So, okay, these are blank tapes. As you can see, these are very blank. <laughs> these are later day ones. There's not really a lot interesting here. Uh, but these are from the days when they actually made these uh, metal tapes, which if you look at, well, that's leader tape, but if you look at a tape and it's got metal or chrome or something on it, it's generally going to be from later and it's going to be a little more, a uh, little better quality, a little more durable. Now here's the kind I was looking for. They actually had these XLS twos max L later on. And this, this, this was such a hard shell, high resonance, damping and heat resistant cassette mechanism. You gotta love that. And, uh, yeah, those were pretty good to leave out in the sun. They didn't really melt a lot. But, yeah, this is kind of un uninteresting uh, unless you want me to tell you about the time I worked with Glenn Danzig. I'll tell you about that sometime. Over here, these are some earlier blank tapes over on this side. Now, this actually, this was super popular. This was the Memorex that was out in the 80s. It came in this kind of uh, dark uh, shell, and you opened it. It's kind of strange, and that tapes looked like this. You know, they were really uh, durable, and this is this is what a lot of people had in the 80s was these Memorex. And, you, and, you know, of course, is it live? Is it Memorex? This one's got the, you know, the tab cover. That was another thing. You had these record tabs here. If you punch those out, you know, it was you, the, the the record button basically would not press down. Here's, uh, here's a tape. Now, this is what blank tapes are good for. Here's a tape my uh, friend made for me in high school with The Cure and Susie and the Banshees and New Order and PIL and the Dead Kennedys and GBH and all kinds of stuff on there. Um, my school was mostly into Bon Jovi and stuff like that. So that we, that was a small percentage of the student body who was into uh, Susie and the Banshees and stuff like that, but still got the tapes that my high school friends made for me to turn, on, uh, turn me on to that music. Now, of course, this was... Uh, this is what some of these cassettes look like new if you bought these super cheap ones at Kmart. And this one boasts that it's got new instant start recording. I remember that. That means that there was no leader tape. And uh, I tried to do something fun. I tried to make a mixtape after all these years, I, and I found these. And uh, I thought, great, I'll, I'll, they're blank. I'll, I'll record something on them, see what's up. And none of them work. They all pulled right out of the thing. They're all deteriorated. And, yeah, that, that whole instant recording thing, um, yeah, Spoiler alert, that didn't last. They went back to leader tape. Now, this is pretty interesting. This is a cassette demagnetizer. Uh, they also had cassette cleaners. This one looks really involved. Man, it has a battery and everything. This, is, this one means business. Now, in addition to these demagnetizers, they also had head cleaning cassettes. And some of them were dry. Some of them you had to put like a little wet thing on, wet them down, and then you put them in the player. And I was always so surprised. And how many people played cassettes all the time in the 80s and never heard anything about head cleaners or cleaning the heads on your tape deck or whatever? Oh my God, I got to do maintenance? It's just, just really easy. It wasn't even like an audiophile thing, like a like a label clamp or something. It was a, I mean, every if you're playing cassettes now, you should be cleaning your heads.
So now that we've talked about cassettes, how about some of the stuff we used to play those things on? Now, my first experience was my brother's Panasonic tape recorder. This is one of the kinds that was out in the 70s a lot. Um, back when cassettes were kind of competing with 8-tracks, but I think most people thought that 8-tracks were more for recording music on and cassettes were more for recording voice on. Uh, that's how kind of cassettes were thought of, and especially little monophonic cassette recorders like this. I got my own uh, in 1979. Uh, as a get well present when I had to go to the hospital. Uh, J.C. JCPenney uh, recorder that actually had a record volume on it, had a pause button. Uh, that was a new feature uh, back then as well, a J.C. JCPenney uh, recorder. Of course, then they started getting more fancy. They started thinking of them more as something to play music on in the 80s. You had the ever popular boom box. Here's one of the ones I had, a dual cassette recorder, all dressed up like Michael Jackson, ready to listen to Thriller. But, uh, yeah, so that they had the boom boxes out. Uh, later on, I had the boom box cassette deck with the CD player on top of it. Uh, so, yeah, all kinds of cassette boom boxes uh, going on in the 80s. Uh, all sizes, too. You had the little kinds that, you know, you get for, like, 40 bucks. Then you had the big-ass things with the, you know, the 12D batteries people would have up on their shoulder. You know, six-speaker type of thing. So, yeah, all, all, all sorts of um, boom boxes. Those kind of went... Out of fashion a little bit, we got the uh, Walkman. Here's one of the later model uh, Walkmans from Sony from the 90s. It has the uh, radio with it and the cassette deck with uh, auto reverse and the uh, chrome switch and all that. I don't know. If, I can't really get in there because as soon as I try, then the lid gets in the way. But the head on this one doesn't rotate. It just, uh, the tape just kind of goes in the reverse direction. So you can imagine how good that sounds in reverse. It, again, does not sound as good going backwards as it does going forwards. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this later model Kenwood I had, that was a pretty good tape deck for the time, uh, has auto reverse, and the entire head and erase head uh, rotate around uh, because it also records uh, in reverse, and you, of course, you have to be able to erase the tape uh, before you record on it, so the whole thing uh, rotates around in there, and, of course, you have the two uh, different uh, cap stands and uh, wheels there, but the thing with that is, is, again... Never records or plays with the sound quality uh, that it plays uh, and records going forward. And yes, this Kenwood does have the uh, search thing and all, all of those later uh, cassette things that they try to kind of model after CD players. Uh, none of it really uh, worked that well. Now, of course, if you were on the go in the 80s, you, of course, had cassette decks for cars as well. Now, there were all kinds. There were the super cheap Krako kind. Uh, I, I went through several uh, versions as I, you know, made more money on the way up. I ended up with a Sony pull-out deck. They used to have them where you could just lift the uh, the front piece off and stick that under your seat or take it with you or whatever so your thing doesn't get stolen. Mine, you pulled the whole thing out and walked around with it. I did that for a couple, you know, I'd take it out and go to work and set it on my desk and eventually it was just left in the car. I'm not walking around everywhere. With a, with a full-on car cassette deck with a handle on it. But sometimes you'd see that in stores. People would do it. They'd be walking around the store with their whole cassette deck on their arm. This fine piece of machinery right here from Panasonic. It's probably one of the last times you could go into a really generic store like a Walmart or a Target and buy a non-ironic <laughs> cassette recorder. The dual cassette deck with the uh, CD at the top and, of course, the radio tuner. This was probably from 2000, I don't know, 2004? 2005, but they really had they got this monster look going on with them. Some of them would just look like, uh, you know, monster trucks come to life or something like that, or some sort of a, a, a thing out of a sci-fi movie. But this one was actually kind of tame. This isn't exactly considered a cassette. This is a micro cassette recorder with a micro cassette in there. This was not really used for music and not really commercially sold with music on there. Usually, this was usually used for. Um, you know, college students that wanted to, uh, you know, just hit record and take notes in uh, class or, you know, bootleggers or somebody that needed a recorder that was small and discreet. The uh, micro cassette. Uh, not a lot of sound quality going on there. Basically, like I said, meant for speech. Well, I'm Robert Fithin, and that is my experience with cassette tapes. Hope you enjoyed it or learned something or at least got a little bit of nostalgia listening to me go on and on about cassettes and how Arista had orange cases and stuff that like that that you need to know. 
please like the video if you liked it. Uh, leave a comment if there's something about tapes that you remember. Like when you would lose the pad and you'd uh, the tape would be all muffled. Or maybe the tape would be twisted around and play backwards. Ah, uh, the memories. Uh, leave me something in the comment section. And subscribe if you want to keep uh, getting notifications on when I'm going to put new videos up. Thanks again for watching.